Thank you, everybody. Um, how's the day going so far for everybody? Having a great time? So one of the things that I think we all can see at this conference is that we have a lot of stories to tell as a community. Um, Gail Jordan, um, the person that was, uh, who I really look up to uh, more than I think anyone in this community, um, was amazing. She was amazing running for office, she was amazing on the stage, and that's why we recognized her as Atheist of the Year at last night's awards dinner, if you were there. But her story isn't the only one um, that we have to tell at this conference and that we have in this community. Um, so I wanna talk about why it's important for us to tell those stories. Um, but first I wanna talk about vision. What vision do we as American atheists and do we as an atheist community have for America? What vision do we have for this community? Why do we even do this? Why do we care so much? That's the question that so many theists ask us any time that they feel threatened by our insistence on our own rights. Why do you care so much? If you don't believe in God, why, why do you keep bringing this up? <laughs> well, the answer is obvious. We care about making the world a better place. We care about building a better world for ourselves and for our kids and for our kids' kids and for all of humanity. The reason we care about this isn't because we hate religion or hate religious people, certainly not. It's not even about just fighting all the time. It's about making the world better. Madeline Murray O'Hare said in her Supreme Court filing in her, in her case, Murray v. Curlett, an atheist thinks that heaven is something for which we should work now, here on earth, for all men together to enjoy. That's what this is about. That's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. To create the heaven that, the, that Christians and religious people are promised after they're dead, to create it here on this earth, in this life that we all know we have. We have that obligation. It's not just what we want, it's what we're called to do. It's what the world demands of us. It's what we should all demand of one another. And so we want a world, our vision is a world where law is based on the best evidence we have available. But it's also based on our shared values. It's based on our commitment to one another as human beings, as part of the same tribe, as part of the same community, and as part of a shared experience. But it's also based on evidence. Where we look at the data, we look at what works, we show our work, we don't just say, you know, we should feed the hungry because our God calls us to do it. No, we feed the hungry because of our shared values and because it saves lives. We educate young people about medically accurate sex ed not because God tells us to, or, or no God tells us to. We do it because it saves lives. The other thing we care about is a world where equality under the law is protected. I think we all agree on that. I think we have common cause with many, many, many religious people about that, uh, but unfortunately not enough of them. Equality under the law is what we fight for every single day in every single state capital, in Washington, D.C., and in court. But, that's a fight that we have to wage every single day that we can't hold back on because the other side isn't. But it's not just about equality and pushing religion necessarily out of the public sphere. It's about having a seat at the table. We often frame these discussions about equality in the terms of a negation. And sometimes we have to, right? We don't want every courthouse in America to be a monument garden to every freaking religion out there. We don't want a Ten Commandment monument. We don't want a Buddhist monument. We don't want a Jewish monument. We don't want all of those on there. We want the court to be a court. 
We want to celebrate our shared values, not have to push each other off into one little monument after another. But what we also need to do is frame inclusion as a positive value. Focus on having a seat at the table versus simply stopping bad things. Moving in a positive direction, not just stopping the attacks on us. But above, above and beyond the law, it's about more than that. It's about what it means to live as an atheist, to live as a person in this world. And part of that is the freedom to believe as you choose to believe. Free from government interference, but also free from social judgment, social pressure, coercion, prejudice. We've heard stories this week, this weekend, about students, young people who have been kicked out of their homes because they stopped believing in God. There are people in this room who have lost friends, family, jobs, loved ones because they left their religion. It's not enough for us to simply demand our legal equality. We must demand our social equality. There is so much pressure and stigma associated with being an atheist in America that you all feel it. You all know what it's like to worry about that. We need to create a world by coming out, by being visible, by st standing tall, and making it easier for the next person after us to walk the same path. Everything we do as atheists, as American atheists, has to be in service to those visions. We have to ask ourselves, why are we doing this thing? What goal is it accomplishing? It's not enough for us just to criticize religion. It's an important component of what we do, but it's not the ends. It's a means to the end of, of having equality. And so how do we measure that success? We're talking about sort of two different areas of success here. First, we're talking about public policy. We're talking about our legal system. So specific concrete victories that we, would, we could win. We could repeal the existing legislation that gives special treatment to religion. Things like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act federally, or the mini RIFRAs in the states, including places like Ohio and Indiana. We could repeal RELUPA, which is a hilariously named law, uh, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, which requires that city governments grant all sorts of variances and uh, exceptions and loopholes for religious land use. So if I wanna open a church, and it just so happens that my church uh, prints, I don't know, a million books a year and has storage tanks of hazardous chemicals for printing books, as long as I'm a church, that's okie dokie. I don't have to have a fire mitigation plan when I set my residential neighborhood on fire. That's a real case, by the way. Success would look like getting rid of the ceremonial deism that we all are confronted with every single day when we pull out our wallets and look at the money. When people say one nation under God, indivisible. Um, when our cities and our courthouses and our schools have one nation under God or in God we trust plastered on every wall. We could also eliminate specific religious exemptions in specific laws things like adoption and foster care laws, civil rights protections, and any number of other laws where loopholes are written in and blow holes in the protections guaranteed by those laws. The, the struggle with all of these, though, is that we can't do them by ourselves. We either need to hugely increase the number of atheists in America, we're at about a quarter, which is great, that's non-religious people, by the way, not just atheists, but they probably agree with us more than they disagree. Um, or we have to find common cause with religious people that see the threat posed by picking and choosing which religions get special treatment and which don't. But in order to do that, we have to convince people that giving up this special place in society isn't a threat to their rights. The other thing we can do is we can make atheism 
or secularism a really salient voting issue, something people vote first on. But we have to do that in both political parties. And so all of these things are really challenging. These are, these are really difficult things to do. And it's hard or even impossible to do without first changing minds. Asking people to give up a position of privilege to people they don't trust, namely us, is a very difficult ask. It's a very difficult thing to accomplish in a short amount of time. In many ways, we've prioritized over the 50 year history of this organization and over the 50 year history of this community, um, I think we've sometimes prioritized the wrong thing first. We've put the cart before the horse. We've tried to change the laws before we change minds. It's not to say we shouldn't do both, we should, but I think we need to start with changing attitudes. This isn't a false choice. This isn't a, 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 a demanded choice. I'm certainly not saying that we can't and we shouldn't move the needle on achievable policy goals. We have to because people's lives are counting on it right now. But the places where we're most likely to get, make the biggest successes will be in partnership with other communities who've already changed hearts and minds about the perceptions of the community. So I'm talking about groups like LGBT organizers. They've been fighting on religious exemptions for years. They've done that, but they've done the hard work of changing minds since the 1960s. Anyone who's been around for this since then knows what it was like, where we went very quickly from the 1990 decision in Texas, Lawrence v. Texas, where sodomy laws were still enforceable in 1995 to now, 20 years later, in 2015, where marriage equality was the law of the land. That is an unimaginably quick turnaround. The way that was done was by shifting perceptions, by showing our shared values, by confronting stereotypes, and by getting to know and being involved in, in our communities. So, we need to know though how, where we're starting. We need to know what we're measuring. We need to change those attitudes, but we can't just do something and hope it works. We need to have evidence. This is a community that cares about evidence, right? So, how do we quantify feelings, right? We're talking about feelings. This is really squishy stuff here. So there are sort of two ways that we can think about this. We can think about the way that people say they think about atheism or our community. And we can also look at implicit and explicit bias. So we're talking about the explicit, the things people will say, and the implicit, the things that they don't say out loud, but they feel or they, they, it's in the back of their mind. And so one of those ways are the thermometer ratings. Thermometer ratings, which I'm gonna show you right now, are where we ask people to put their feelings towards some group on a scale from zero is the coolest or coldest to 100 is the warmest. How do you feel, what's your attitude toward specific groups? And you can see there on the left, June 2014, atheists had an average rating of 40%, 41, excuse me. Muslims were at 40. But those attitudes have shifted quickly. Three years later, we're at 50. So people are meh about us, which I suppose is slightly better than openly hostile. <laughs> we'll take it. Um, but if you look at every other religious group, they've also moved up in that time frame, with one exception, evangelical Christians. <laughs> And the interesting thing about that is the, the, on the right side there, you can see the breakdown by age. For young people, for the students, for people who are millennials and zennials and whatever the one younger than that is, everybody's kind of clustered around the middle there. Everybody, there, there are three different groups at 59 on the rating scale. Atheists, Protestants, and Evangelical Christians. For some reason, Buddhists are hugely popular among the young people. Um, if you look at everyone else though, it starts spreading out and atheists uh, and Muslims head toward the bottom of the, of the pile. 
especially for older folks, people who were raised in a context that told them that atheists and Muslims and people of minority religions were scary and evil and bad. And if you look at, at this, uh, this, th this next chart here, this is a rating of how each religion thinks about every other religion. And it turns out every religion kind of likes themselves, go figure. <laughs> but if you notice, the only uh, numbers on this chart that are in that most negative scale are the way white evangelicals feel about us and the way we feel about white evangelicals. <laughs> I, that's, that's one element of hostility I think I'm okay with for, the, for now. Let's focus on some other groups first. We'll, we'll go with the easier groups first. Um, another way we can look at this is implicit bias. This is sort of a weird, confusing chart, um, but it does show an important thing. Um, at the University of Kentucky is a really fantastic psychology professor named Will Gervais, who has looked at biases, um, specifically against our community. Um, he, his, his hypothesis is that the religious faithful tend to distrust us for two reasons. Um, number one, kind of a mental shorthand we all have to do when we're confronted with someone we don't know, where we have to make a snap decision about how we feel about someone in a very short amount of time. Um, and we do that using shared values and using our preconceptions and using the information we have available. Um, and evangelical Christians or religious people in general um, tend to think that religion is shorthand for morality because that's what they've been taught. Um, and the second um, part of that is a lack of familiarity. People don't know us. They think they don't know atheists at all. They think our community is rare. We need to change that. The second uh, hypothesis he had was that it kind of runs, it was interesting because it runs counter to how prejudices are generally shown to exist, especially along racial lines. Um, when you're talking about racial minority groups, um, as a group becomes more prevalent, it is seen as more of a threat. Um, we, we've, we've seen that in communities where um, African Americans um, move in or immigrants or any, any particular identifiable group comes into the community, as that community increases, people tend to distrust or feel threatened much more. They view the increased presence as a threat to their power. And with atheists though, the opposite is true. And his hypothesis about why this might be is because there's this huge tension between the belief on the one hand that atheists are these immoral monsters running around murdering people and, uh, you know, as Gail said, eating babies and things like that. But the fact that we don't, you don't see those people, like that, that's not true. And as atheists are increasing, they're not seeing this huge increase in random murders or whatever it is that we're supposed to be doing. The simple fact is that and according to this research is that telling religious adherents that there are more atheists than they think reduces bias. It especially reduces implicit bias. Um, the chart on the right there, uh, or in the middle I should say, is they basically just lied to students and said, oh yeah, 30% or half of the community are atheists, and then ran this, uh, this test to measure implicit bias, and it almost disappeared by basically lying to them, but we shouldn't do that. Um, but by showing or telling them or planting the seed that there are more atheists than they thought, it forced them to confront this tension, this dissonance, that if we're so bad, how come I'm not seeing it? And I think it's one of the reasons why young people are leaving religion as well, because they're told over and over and over again that anyone who's not a part of the church, who's not part of their family's religion, is an immoral monster who's going to hell and yet they go to college, they step out of their small community, they meet people who are not like them, and it doesn't, it's not true. And you know, the, that, that saying, who are you gonna believe, me or your lying eyes, is, is exactly what's happening. The pastors are telling them that. Well, you need to believe me, don't, don't believe your eyes. Don't believe your experiences, don't believe that the people you love who are not like you 
they're, they're secretly evil people. And young people aren't buying it. They're not buying what pastors are selling, which is great. But so this, this is an interesting piece of evidence because it indicates that we don't actually have to convert a bunch of people to be atheists yet <laughs> to make advances in policy, to change minds, to make it easier, to reduce stereotypes and reduce stigma in our community. All we have to do is show the numbers that are there. We have to be better marketers. And that will be what makes more atheists. That will be what breaks down the stigma that young people face in coming out as atheists. That's what will break down the stigma that made it difficult for Jim Obergefell, someone who is an icon of equality, to come, have to come out as an atheist here on our stage. Because it's difficult. But we can do that. We can do that by talking about our shared values. We have values. We have shared experiences. We have shared stories. When we're talking about specific policy proposals and court cases and things like that, we get bogged down sometimes in this Supreme Court case or that precedent or this figure or this piece of data. What we really need to do that will move the needle on equality and make the laws better, but will also break down these barriers and make it easier to be an atheist, is tell our stories. We have to find opportunities for people within our community who have been harmed by religion and harmed by religious privilege to show that, to tell those stories. We know that there are atheists out there who just aren't saying it, who are sitting silently in church pews every single Sunday, but not claiming the atheist mantle, staying in church. And why are they doing that? They're doing that because they don't hear us talking about our values and they don't hear us and see us providing community. They don't see us providing the things that church provides for them above and beyond the dogma. And so we need to do things to meet those needs that still align with our values. And I'm not saying that American Atheist is gonna turn into a megachurch. It's not, don't worry. But what we have to do is build strong local community groups that can meet the needs of the people that are there and can bring in new people. We have to challenge the stereotypes about our community that we're disengaged, the stereotypes that we just sit around in this room and talk about how we agree that God doesn't exist. This would be a really short conference. <laughs> we have to talk about confronting the stereotype that we're angry and uncharitable, that we're dogmatic, that we don't care about each other, that we don't care about the people outside this room. We need to communicate the fact that our atheism leads us to a place where we know that we have this one shot at life, and if we screw it up, that's it. This is not a dress rehearsal. This is what we have. And so we have an obligation to care for one another, to build those communities, and to lean on one another in difficult times. So why, why do telling our stories work? Why, why does this sort of warm fuzziness work? Well, let me, let me be science-y real quick. It's neuroscience. Everyone loves neuroscience, right? Any neuroscientists in the house? Yeah, there you go, yes. <laughs> Everyone loves oxytocin, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, literally. It <laughs> um, oxytocin production, telling these stories, triggering those parts of the brain make people more willing to work together to engage in cooperative behaviors, to help other people. Um, having these stories of, with narrative tension and character-driven uh, stories and human-scale stories and tying a purpose to the work that we do with those stories works. It, and churches have known this. People sometimes in this community, and I do this as well, fall into the, the, the idea that we can bludgeon people to death with the facts. That if we just give them the data, they will make the choice themselves. That they will see how obvious it was. But it doesn't work, or it rarely works. 
The human brain is not a number crunching machine. It doesn't work like that. The other side has known this and exploited this for millennia. We can use that approach, we can use some of those tools in a way that is non-exploitative, in a way that lives up to our values and can illustrate the concrete in an emotional way. They can illustrate what we're doing with the law on a human scale, because that's what this is all about. It's about each other, and it's about our obligation to the larger human community. And so I wanna show you a video um, that was done by another organization that is, I think, a really effective way to get this across, um, and is something that we're going to be doing more of, telling those stories, finding a way to communicate that. So I'm gonna show this right now. So this was a story um, about two people who wanted to adopt uh, a foster care child they were taking care of. Someone who, they had, their sibling was going through a rough spot and had a child and needed, they needed to lean on their family. And they wanted to adopt the child. But they lived in Arizona, a state where there is no law preventing state-funded adoption agencies from not discriminating against married couples because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. One of the people in that, in that video is trans and was told that they could not foster a child because he was trans. And our tax dollars are going for, to, to, to fund that, to fund that type of discrimination in the name of religion. That has nothing to do with the best interests of a child. And I know that because I'm an adopted child. When my birth mother was 16, she got pregnant with me. She herself was adopted. When she was 17, she gave birth and I was adopted by my parents. And when my parents adopted me, they were not asked, what religion are you? Where do you go to church? Are you gonna take him to church? How do you pray? Any of that. The only thing that mattered was, will you look out for his best interests? Will you love him? Will you take care of him? And the answer to that question was yes. And that's all that mattered. In South Carolina, um, the Trump administration has just granted a waiver that would allow a state-funded, federally-funded adoption agency in South Carolina to discriminate using federal tax dollars. And they're not just discriminating against LGBT people, though we're normally one of the primary targets of these laws. They discriminated against a woman who wanted to be a mentor for foster youth because she herself has fostered dozens and dozens of children and has foster kids with her still. She wanted to be a mentor for the largest foster care provider in her community. She got all the way through the process and they said, great, what's your religion? And she said, Catholic. And they said, oh, we don't work with Catholics. We only work with evangelicals. You have to be born again. This is a woman who's fostered multiple children, who has kids who have lived through the system, who wanted to help their community, and they can't. And they're being discriminated against on our tax dollars, or with our tax dollars in our name, that's unacceptable. And if you think that discrimination against a Catholic or discrimination against an LGBT person is in any way unrelated to discrimination against us, I've got news for you. The very same people would just as readily discriminate against us. Um, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, um, one of the groups we work very closely with on these issues um, has just filed a lawsuit uh, against the provider in South Carolina and against the Trump administration. Um, yeah. And to bring it closer, um, in back at this last election, um, the state of Michigan, where I'm, I was born and raised, um, elected uh, an openly uh, lesbian uh, attorney general. Um, and she has dropped... Um, 
the, the state of Michigan had a, a ballot initiative that would have allowed adoption agencies to do exactly what happened in South Carolina. She said, no, we're not doing that. It's unconstitutional, I'm not gonna defend it, we're gonna, st we're gonna stand back from this. Now, the other side, the Alliance Defending Freedoms, the American Family Association, the Liberty Council people are suing the state of Michigan so that adoption agencies can discriminate against whoever they want in the name of religion. Um, but I came through that system in Michigan. So this is personal for me. This is about more than if I want to adopt children in the future, which I do. It's not about that. It's about my family as it currently exists, my parents. These people would see to it that my family could have never existed all in the name of their religion. These people would see that I would never have had the opportunities that I had in order to enforce some backward, dogmatic, hateful bigotry against people using our tax dollars. And to that, I have every right to say, fuck that. We have every right to be angry, to be upset, and to be forceful when religion is attacking our rights, our families, and our loved ones. But we need, and we need to tell that story. We should own that, that, that anger. I am angry about that. I am angry at being told that my family is less worthy than the families of bigoted Christians that kick their kids out when they come out as gay or when they come out as trans, or when they come out as atheists, or when they decide, you know what, actually I'm gonna be a Methodist instead of a Southern Baptist. Get out of this house. I'm sorry. Those people do not have any, any claim to morality or to values. And we need to push back on that with everything we have. It's not enough for us just to say that religion is bad. We need to show how it is. It's not enough for us to just say that religion is wrong. We need to show how it's harming people. We can debate and we should debate. We can educate and we need to educate. But at the end of the day, the human connection is what matters. My connection to all of you and the connection that voters and legislators can have to us. That's what will change minds. That's what will move the needle toward equality. And while it's important for us to do these debates and do the education and all of that, it is. Building community, where spaces where that can happen is the best way to do it. And that's why, we're, that's why we're doing it here at American Atheist. Everyone in this room has a story to tell and you need to tell it. And so what we're going to do at American Atheist is give you the platform to tell that story. There are stories in this room and in, at this conference that you've all heard, friends that you've made, people whose experiences you've shared. Stories like Gail's being attacked for marrying, performing a marriage for her friends. People like Frady, who was forced into an arranged marriage. People like Lorelai, who experienced discrimination every single day. People like Kevin Bowling, who works with students who are kicked out of their homes, kicked out of college, threatened for not believing in God anymore. People are denied access to government services, to health care, not just because of the religion of the, the general religion that's out there, but because we've turned over 80% of long-term care beds to, the Catholic, to Catholic and uh, Methodist hospitals in this country. People are being told that they can't access essential reproductive health care because of one small religious group in this country. We need to tell those stories. That's the only way that we can win. But we have to start by identifying exactly what the problems in our community are. And that's why we're doing these focus groups. I hope that many of you have participated in those focus groups this weekend. This is just phase one though. I said earlier, we can't only rely on data and facts and, and whatnot, but we have to have a solid foundation of that. We have to know which stories to tell. We have to know what's working. But in order to do that, we need to hear from you. 
We need you to tell us what matters. What matters to you? What experiences have you had in the name of religion that has brought you here? And so with this data collection project that we've launched, we're trying to build capacity in five areas. Those five areas are understanding, advocacy, funding, inclusion, and research. These play into the things that American Atheists has to do as a leading advocate for atheism in America. We're calling this uh, the United States Secular Survey because unfortunately, not all the people that we're looking at are yet atheists, but that's okay. Um, we were originally going to call it the American Secular Survey, but the acronym was really bad, so we switched it. <laughs> that's 100% that's true, by the way. We, like, we printed up the, 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 the one pager in the summary, and I looked at it and went, oh man. <laughs> Ass, great. <laughs> um, would, it would have led to some funnier fundraising appeals, but that's okay. Well, I think professionalism is probably the way to go here. But anyway, um, we need to understand this community. Um, we have a diverse group of people in this room, people with varied experiences who have shared a, a, a common, or have a common endpoint, but have very different paths to it. And so we need to understand the challenges that we have faced in getting to this point. As any researcher will say, anecdote is not, or I'm sorry, the plural of anecdote is not data, except for sufficiently high values of anecdote. But accurate, scientifically based research using proven best practices is the way for us to start to understand the core of this community, the lives that you all live, our hopes, our dreams, our desires, what we're looking for in community, what we want, and the impact of living in a society that deeply stigmatizes who we are. The next step of that is advocacy. Making it easier for us to walk into an office in your state capitol and say, Representative, Senator, here are the people in your district that care about this issue. We know because we have the data, here it is. And if you vote this way on this bill, those people are gonna have something to say about it. We can tell the stories of the people in those communities and change the minds of legislators. How many of you have gone to a state capitol or a local government council meeting and talked to a member of your elected official or talked to an elected official and said, here's how I want you to vote on this. This is important to me. How many people have done that? Look around you. That's, that's a great number, it's a great start, but this is something that we can all do. Telling your personal story to a legislator, to an elected official, makes all the difference. We can give them a fact sheet, but having a personal story of a person they represent is what will change their minds. How do we move the needle on these issues? It's by bringing you with us. And while that isn't always po possible, literally, we ha we, if we have your stories, we can bring you into the room with us. Currently, we can't really answer the question about how this policy will affect our community in a personal way, because we just don't have those stories. So unless you're physically with us, we're missing out on the most powerful tool we have to change minds. Um, the third one is in er, inclusion. Better data, um, getting better data about the size of our community, the scope of atheism in America, will help us build stronger partnerships with groups we wanna work with. In the LGBTQ community, they've done survey after survey after survey and have so much great data about the makeup of the community. Half of LGBTQ people are non-religious. Something like 40% of trans people are atheists, not just non-religious. That's, that's important data because we can walk in and say, hey, we need you to work with us because half of your community is on our side. And that's been powerful and that's been helpful. But now we need to do that for other movements. We need to know how many in our community care about the environment, care about climate change. How many people in our community care about public education? How many people in our community care about reproductive health? We need those numbers so we can make better policy and even more importantly, make those 
communities more inclusive of us. I can't tell you how many times I've walked into any type of meeting of allies, of policy groups and whatever, that have started with a prayer. That start with a Protestant prayer. And I, I, sat at a, I was at a table, uh, sharing a table with two Jews and one other atheist at a uh, LGBT organization's, uh, it was a faith and family something or other. And somehow the two Jews and the two atheists ended up at the same table. And they had an opening prayer and another prayer and another prayer and we all just kind of looked at each other. And finally, I raised my hand and said, you know, I, I appreciate that this is a faith thing, but you invited atheists and you invited Jews and you invited, I'm sure, other denominations, and yet you're leaving us out. And they said, oh, you know, we didn't even consider that. It's like, you invited me, okay. Um, all we have to do is say it sometimes and let them know and they do better sometimes. The fourth one is research. Academics, people want data. People, we should be funding that sort of thing. We should be turning this information over so people can build the next thing. Um, we have some really fantastic minds in this room, in this community, but unless they have data to work with, it's much harder to do their jobs. The last one is funding, closing the spending gap. Um, these are some of the organizations that are on the other side of the debate, quote unquote, just in the policy space. If you were here this morning, um, Noel and the folks from Foundation Beyond Belief put up some numbers about the Mormon church and the Catholic church. The Mormon church has, I think it was $200 billion. The Catholic church has 112, not counting property. These are the groups that work in the courts and work in the legislatures to take away our rights. You add all that up, we're talking about 175, 200 million dollars. What's the budget of American atheists? It's a lot less than 200 million. <laughs> uh, in fact, it's about 100 times less than that. The single largest, most well-funded atheist organization is the Center for Inquiry. Their budget, five or six million. The smallest group on this list is more well-funded than the best-funded atheist group. So we need to let that sink in and do something about it. Now, I'm relatively sure that no one in this room is sitting on $200 million and just wants to help us equalize this right away. If you are, I'll be available after this to chat. <laughs> but one of the places we can make up this gap is with foundations. Groups that give money for specific purposes, for education, for research, for policy. But they require a foundation of data. They require that we show that we're making, we're doing good things with their money. Go figure. In 2015 alone, foundations gave out $62 billion to organizations in the US. And in 2017, the federal government awarded $700 billion in grants of grants and service, direct service and things like that. How much of it went to secular organizations advancing secular causes? Zero. Basically zero, we'll say. How much of it went to churches doing service? Catholic groups who provide birth control, and by provide I mean counsel against it, that provide family planning service, and by family planning service I mean advocating the rhythm method, and that do nothing to actually stop the spread of HIV, but they have a grant to do it because they're opposed to condoms. They got billions and billions of dollars to do this, to not do the job. We're over here ready to do the job, but we can't access it because we don't have the data. 24% of Americans are non-religious. That's the best estimate we have. But we don't know much about them. We're sort of grouped all together in this one blob of non-religion. We don't know what's taken people from belief to non-belief. We don't know what's taken people from non-belief into belief. We don't know any of those stories about our community. 
And that's what we need to change so that we can tell the stories of our community and make the lives of our children and of the next generation better than ours. So that's what we're here for. We're done just being angry. We're done just bludgeoning people with facts and figures. We're gonna tell stories. We're gonna connect. We're gonna talk about our values. And yes, we are going to share facts, figures, logic, and reason as well, because I, I, I know we can't help ourselves. We love it. <laughs> but we need to know more about our community. It's not enough that we just do what seems right. And so it's time for us to change that approach. So thank you so much, and I'll be happy to take a few questions. So Callie has a microphone. If anyone wants yeah, to ask some questions, I'm happy to check. Check. Yeah, we've got about five minutes, so just please make sure make sure your questions are brief, so we can get as many for Nick as we can. Okay. Good morning. Morning. I was told to talk to you. Sure. I am absolutely livid. Friday morning, Good Friday morning, on MSNBC, a place you would not expect to have this happen. Morning Joe, Mika Brzezinski, and Joe Scarborough, and Donnie Deutsch had their little thing going on. And out of the blue, they started talking about the church fire in Paris and how people got together and prayed and how that was helping. And they went from that to a discussion about what Good Friday means to people. But here's where it twisted. They began to talk about the fact, it was the implication, the fact that the only communities that are successful in changing their community for the better are faith communities. Now, they didn't say it in those words, but this was national television, this was prime time, right before they were changing the hour. And I stood there and I went, what? I don't know what to do about it, but I just wanted you to know, I want people to go on the website on MSNBC, look at the video, it's, I think it's the last hour, and do something, write the station, whatever. So, you know, th this goes back into what I talked about, about prejudices against our community, the stereotype that we're disengaged, that we don't care. If they think that we're not, that secular communities can't change things for the better, um, we're packing 50,000 meals tomorrow. You know, we raised, this community raised $15,000 in five days to do that project. Um, I think it was Dale McGowan in the um, first panel this morning who said, it's not the God belief that compels people to be a good person or to do charity or anything like that. It's getting together in a literal room and literally being asked for money once in a while. That's it, that's what makes people give. And so what we need to do to improve that stereotype is emulate the things that churches do well that comport with our values. Getting together, providing social support. When, when people stay in church, it's not because they believe in the dogma, it's be necessarily. It's because when something bad happens, when your spouse gets sick, when your kid is sick, you know that you can call somebody from church and if you're from the Midwest like me, someone will show up at your door with a glass casserole dish filled with tater tots, uh, ground beef cheese, and probably some sort of mayonnaise. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's that social support that we can do. There's nothing, there's no, there's no monopoly on that for God belief. There's no religious ownership of that. So if that's the type of community you want, you have to build it, unfortunately. They have a really long head start on us. But that means that we can take the things that are good, ditch the stuff that sucks, and use that to support ourselves, support each other, and to grow this community and to challenge those stereotypes. So that's how I think is the best way to do it. It's not to just, we, we should yell at them, but we should also show them that they're wrong because that's even more powerful. 
पर... <laughs> Pardon me, my accent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you told one thing that people, everyone has a story to share with you. How do the people go about sharing that with you? Are there a group of people to whom you are committee to talk to or how do we go about it? Sure. Number one. Number two in the second part. I come from India. I was really scared. So many gods and everything coming to this has really enlightened me a lot. I am almost at the edge of the average lifespan of mine. I am delighted I came here for the first time. Yeah. At the same time, when I heard about the Satanism and everything again, are you not promoting in the stories? It scared me really because again deities, rituals, what was the purpose of it? These two things I could not understand. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, so two, there are two parts to that question. Number one, how do you share our story, or your stories with us? Um, check your email because we're going to be going, we're, you're going to get more information about that. Uh, the first thing you could absolutely do is if you haven't already, there are some focus groups that will be uh, this afternoon. Callie, do you remember the time? 4.45. Thank you. 4, 4.45? Yeah, um, that are uh, that you can sign up for. There's also an open one um, that I, I don't know if it's completely full. It may be full now, but that's the one at 4:45. That was the one at 4:45. Okay, so sign up for those. Take part in those focus groups. That's the first step. The second thing that we're doing, we'll be announcing some more programs that will be collecting the stories, faces of our community, things like that. Just be be available. Be ready. Be willing to put yourself out there a little bit. It's scary. I get that. I get that it can be really intimidating to put your face up on something, to own atheism, right? Um, what you said, secondly, about being raised in a very religious society and you know, feeling a little bit of sort of uh, uh, being scared or, or, or being a little bit uneasy about some of this, um, we're all victims of that structure. We've all been raised in societies where religion is given special treatment, where we're told that atheists are less moral. And we, we actually ingrain that on ourselves sometimes, even when um, consciously, um, explicitly, we say, oh no, of course, atheists are even more moral than religious people. Uh, but when you measure the implicit biases, many of us still carry around that with us, even after we've left religion, because that ingrains so deeply on our psyches. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's, a strong, it's a long, hard struggle to get past that. And it just takes time. Um, and so, that, that, I guess, is the best answer I have for that, so. Give it up for Nick Fish. Thank you, everybody.